Fuse it today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I don't feel like I should quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> yeah. If I look like I'm squinting, it's because I can't see you all very well because of these the lights. So. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Munoz and the center for inviting me and making it so pleasant. And I'd like to thank Maggie Garnett, who originally invited me just to visit Notre Dame. And uh, I'm very, very fond of Maggie and her parents. Um, before I get to my prepared remarks, some years ago, Justice Scalia told me that I should get out on the road and fly the flag. Well, uh, he tended to be more of an extrovert than I am. Uh, I'm quite content not to get out on the road. <laughs> but <clears throat> when Professor Munoz asked me to talk a bit about the Declaration, uh, actually, when I heard that he wanted me to do that, my bride and I, Virginia, were in, we were RVing in the mountains of North Carolina and uh, Tennessee. Um, the, but we noticed something there when we were thinking, when I was thinking about this um, and before I started preparing remarks, that the large number of flags of people who still believe in the ideal of this country, in an environment when there's so much criticism, antagonism, and actually people with disdain for the very same. It was very interesting to be with regular people for three weeks. <laughs> um, and I love this, one of the reasons we've been RVing, uh, RV advocates and been RVing for over two decades. Um, we simply love to be a part of that. The other thing that I might note about the Declaration is some years ago, I decided to drive with my law clerks to Gettysburg. It was after particularly difficult terms and you could sense them getting a little irritated but I wanted them to understand why we do what we do. It's not about us. It's not about winning and losing at the court. It is about the entire country and the idea of this country. So our annual trip is to Gettysburg for that purpose. So this is pretty special to me. I must admit, because I don't recycle speeches, these things are quite a bit of work. And also trying to make sure that you actually talk with, not to, or at your audience. So first of all, again, let me thank um, Maggie and Professor Munoz and Notre Dame. It's been quite some time since I've been here, and this has been very enjoyable. I also like to thank the students that I've interacted with. They always stimulate thinking. I have never left an interaction with students who really wanted to learn without learning so much myself. So <clears throat> I'd like to thank Maggie for her introduction, which I think was far too generous and kind, but um, it only deepens my affect affection for her. As I said, it is an honor to be here with you all in South Bend. I've been fortunate, as, as I alluded earlier, to have visited here a number of times and to have a number of former clerks on the law school faculty. 
I have also been fortunate to have a number of your outstanding law school graduates clerk for me, and they were outstanding indeed. And now I have one of your graduates as a colleague. And of course, I knew Justice uh, Barrett as a law clerk for Justice Scalia some years ago and as a member of the Notre Dame Law School faculty. I pray that she has a long and fruitful tenure on the court. This university has been a stalwart, and I'd add as an aside, had I seen this university when I applied to college, there is no doubt I would have been here. <laughs> uh, in fact, I think I still have a few years that I could go to college. <clears throat> but this university has been a stalwart of American academia, and one of the universities we revered from afar in Savannah, Georgia, during my youth. Its stated mission has been unwavering, the pursuit of truth for its own sake. And its inspiration has been divine. Jesus Christ as the source of wisdom in whom all things can be brought to its completion. I should come, it should come as no surprise then that Notre Dame attracts and produces so many talented scholars and students. I am particularly grateful for the outstanding scholarship and graduates this university has produced. This is further demonstrated by the outstanding students, as I alluded to in Professor Munoz's class that I've had a chance to interact with. From time to time, Justice Scalia and I talked about how similar we were, yet so different. We tended to independently arrive at the same conclusion in so many cases, yet he was from an educated family in the urban Northeast, while I was from an uneducated family from the Deep South. Of course, the condescending media elites accused me of being his flunky, which bothered him much more than it bothered me. <laughs> I was used to bigotry. I, unlike him, I was used to bigotry paternalism and condescension. He was not. After Justice Scalia died, I mentioned our conversation to one of his sons, Father Paul Scalia. He immediately attributed our shared judicial approach to our formation. We were both Catholics, attended parochial schools, and despite the geographic separation, benefited from a common culture. This may seem somewhat anachronistic today, so when so many of our common bonds had been severed. The differences are now much more pronounced since they are, they are, they are no longer ameliorated or temporized by what we all have in common. In my youth, we believed in our country's aspirational motto, E Pluribus Unum, despite the reality of unequal treatment. In this postmodern multicultural world, the emphasis is decidedly on the pluribus and not the unum. So much of my thinking about the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence is influenced by this formation and the world of my youth. Much the same can be said for the Declaration itself. It was decidedly influenced by the shared culture and the attitudes of the founding generation. It was not a grand theory cooked up by a few men. I'm sure you are you all are somewhat aware of my aversion to esoteric theories that have little or remote bearing on day-to-day -day life, past or present. It could be, that, be the case that having grown up with people 
who did not have the luxury of contriving theories unrelated to daily life, I have become uncomfortable with the deductive approach to reasoning. No one in my life started by coming up with a theory first and seeing how it squared with the facts second. There was no time for that. My family's, friends, and neighbors' subsistence depended on a more inductive, experiential approach. They did, <clears throat> they did what worked uh, best based on experience, not on theory. I believe this was the case for the founding generation as it was for me. I'm a product of the state of Georgia, the Georgia of the 1950s and 60s. The world where I grew up was quite different from the world of today. That is obvious and borders on a truism. In the race-based, a race-obsessed world of today, one would think that, or could think, uh, that I'm talking about ref or referring solely to race. But alas, I'm not. I mean much more than that. In those days of the 1950s, there was, of course, quotidian and pervasive segregation and race-based laws, which were repulsive and at odds with the principles of our country. It was a world of the solid South when the Democrats were routinely referred to as Dixiecrats. But despite that, there was a deep and abiding love for our country and a firm desire to have the rights and responsibilities of full citizenship. Regardless how society treated us, there was never any doubt that we were equally entitled to claim the promise of America as our birthright and equally duty-bound to honor and defend her to the best of our ability. We held these ideals first and foremost because we were raised to know that, as children of God, we were inherently equal and equally responsible for our actions. In my generation, one of the central aspects of our lives was religion and religious education. The The single biggest event in my early life was going to live with my grandparents in 1955. My grandfather was a Catholic convert and very devout. As a result, my brother and I were sent to St. Benedict the Moore Grammar School, where I entered the second grade. Between my grandparents and my nuns, I was taught pedagogically and experientially to navigate through and survive the negativity of a segregated world without negating the good that there was. Or as my grandfather frequently said, without throwing the baby out with the bath water. To this day, I revere, admire, and love my nuns. They were devout, courageous, and principled women. The first to teach me was Sister Mary Dolorosa, my second grade teacher. I was not Catholic at the time and had only one or two memories of ever having gone to church before St. Benedict's. As a part of our catechism lesson, Sister Mary Dolorosa asked, why did God create you? In unison, our class of about 40 kids would answer loudly, reciting the Baltimore Catechism. God created me to know, love, and serve him in this life and to be happy with him in the next. Through many years of school and extensive reading since then, I have yet to hear a better Uh, explanation of why we are here. It was the motivating truth of my childhood. 
and remains a central, uh, it remains as a central truth today. Because I'm a child of God, there is no force on this earth that can make me any less than a man of equal dignity and equal worth. This was an a priori truth that was repeatedly restated and echoed throughout the segregated world of my youth. This accepted truth reinforced our proper roles as equal citizens, not the perversely distorted and reduced role offered us by Jim Crow, a role that is not unlike the reduced but apparently more palatable image of blacks that is bandied about or assigned to us today. Whether deemed inferior by the crudest bigots or considered a victim by the most educated elites, being dismissed as anything other than inherently equal is still at bottom a reduction of our human worth. My nuns at St. Benedict's taught me that that was a lie. And to paraphrase Solzhenitsyn, we were not to live by that lie. In God's eyes, we were inherently equal, and that was that. This truth permeated our home life as well, though less with a focus on rights and more with a focus on what was required of us as children of God. My grandparents held fast to this belief. In God's eyes, we were all equal. And because of that, not only did we deserve to be treated equally, but we also were required to conduct ourselves as children of God. Hence, we were to live our lives according to his word. My grandparents repeatedly stressed that because of our fallen nature, we had to earn our bread by the sweat of our brows. There was no room to doubt this and even less for self-pity. My grandfather would let us know in no uncertain terms that there were to be no excuses, though he knew as well as anyone that many were convenient and possibly legitimate. As he often said, old man can't is dead. I helped bury him. And it wasn't just my grandparents who were watching us. As they saw things on Judgment Day, we would be held accountable for the use of our God-given talents and our opportunities. As I overheard one of the, the deacons from my grandmother's Baptist church say, God is a big-eye God. He was all-seeing and all-knowing. It behooved us to walk a straight and narrow path. Admittedly, much of this sounds anachronistic today. Perhaps we have grown too cosmopolitan or cynical for the theology of barely literate but wise people. But my grandparents' beliefs were not unique to that era. If anything, they were commonplace and virtually universal. There was little that was different about us except our Catholicism, which was quite unique. As I reflect on my life, the family that my grandparents provided for my brother and me was the fountainhead of the moral guidance in our lives. The Catechism of the Catholic Church puts it well. The family is the original cell of social life. It is the community in which, from childhood, one can learn moral values, begin to honor God, and make good use of freedom. Family life is an initiation into the life in society. That was certainly the case in our house. During my childhood, those around us took this calling seriously our neighbors and those in our daily lives 
taught us that God loved us equally. And that America stood for that same ideal, even though it had failed to live up to it. Despite this failure, our Christian duty was to still love our country, even as we objected to its evident shortcomings. This was more than a belief. It was a way of life. I lived in a world of unexaggerated but pervasive patriotism. We were to be good, productive, and loyal citizens, and that was that. This was our country. and no one could deny us that inheritance. Nor were we to disinherit ourselves by rejecting our own country and our birthright of full citizenship. So at the beginning of each school day, we lined up by class, two by two, and said the Pledge of Allegiance. And when the local television station signed off at night, an event which we rarely got to see, there was a beautiful rendition of the national anthem and the poem, High Flight. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand, and touch the face of God. No matter how much others might deny our full inheritance, we were not to act as though we had been disinherited, and we were not to act badly because others had acted badly. I cannot say that I have always lived by this injunction, Unfortunately, for too many years of my life, I lost sight of that lesson and saw it as a sign of weakness or cowardice. When Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968, I lost faith in the teachings of my childhood and succumbed to an array of angry ideologies. Indeed, that was why I left the seminary. in May of 1968. I let others and my emotions persuade me that my country and my God had abandoned me. I became disoriented, disenchanted with my faith and my country and deeply embittered. And perhaps worst of all, I let my family down. This was further exacerbated when my grandfather asked me to leave his house following my abandonment of my vocation. I was 19 years old. I was consumed by negativity, cynicism, animus, uh, and any other negative emotion you can conjure up. Sadly, the destructive disposition that I exhibited then appears to be celebrated today. I left Savannah for college at Holy Cross that following fall, where I fell in quickly with radical ideologies such as black power. It was an era of disenchantment and deconstruction. The beliefs of my youth were subjected to the John eye of critical theories, or perhaps more accurately, cynical theories. What had given my life meaning and a sense of belonging, that this country was my home, was jettisoned as old-fashioned and antiquated. It was considered preposterous to believe in such outmoded things. Having rejected my faith, my family, and my country, I was searching for something to occupy me. It was easy and convenient to fill that void with victimhood. A black man with an ax to grind. So many of my folk, time focused intently, excuse me. So many of us focused intently on our racial differences and grievances, much like today, I'm afraid. 
My grandfather, a man of reality, not theory, often asked me in an exasperated tone, when you get your way and undermine this country, then what? Other times, he would simply walk away, wondering out loud why he and my grandmother had made so many sacrifices for me. From time to time, he would ominously forewarn me, you just live long enough, you'll see. As usual, he was right. As I matured, I began to see that the theories of my young adulthood were destructive and self-defeating. After recognizing that I was adrift, what I realized more than anything else is that I needed to regain common sense and judgment and what I had jettisoned. I had rejected my country my birthright as a citizen, and I had nothing to show for it. Perhaps that is the ultimate destination of nihilistic ideologies. The wholesomeness of my childhood had been replaced with an emptiness, cynicism, and despair. I was faced with the simple fact that there was no greater truth than what my nuns and my grandparents had taught me. We are all children of God, and rightful heirs to our nation's legacy of civic equality. We were duty-bound to live up to obligations of the full and equal citizenship to which we were entitled by birth. On the morning of April 16, 1970, after returning from a riot, I stood outside the chapel at Holy Cross and asked God to take hate out of my heart. I use this background to set the stage for my later and more in-depth encounter with the Declaration of Independence in the mid-1980s. At that time, having run agencies and seen how the federal government actually worked, I became deeply interested in the Declaration of Independence. I had hoped it would bring some clarity to the the cacophonous world in which I found myself. Studying the founding, though, f studying the founding, however, felt more like a return to familiar ground, the ground of my upbringing. The Declaration captured what I had been taught to venerate as a child, but had cynically rejected as a, as a young man. All men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. In so declaring, the Declaration of Independence did not propose to have discovered anything new. Its truths were self-evident. They were beyond dispute. They were a priori in the society of my youth, imbibed at school, home, and in the culture. They were a given. And as I rediscovered the God-given principles of the Declaration and our founding, I eventually returned to the church, which had been teaching the same truths for millennia. That the Declaration set forth self-evident truths was no accident. The founders, quite frankly, didn't have the time or the mandate to reinvent the wheel or the world. Between April and July 1776, the fervor for, the, for independence was palpable throughout the colonies. The colonies, their counties and towns, and even trade associations were drafting their own declarations of independence. The late historian Pauline Mayer estimated that there were 90 such declarations during this time frame, though not all were specifically denoted as such. These lesser known declarations typically began with lists of grievances against the British Empire. Among them were George III's rejection of the Olive Branch petition, 
Great Britain's use of Indian tribes and German mercenaries to wage war against the colonies, and Parliament's prohibitory act cutting off all trade between the colonies and England. The declarations then asserted that these usurpations were at odds with man's invaluable rights and privileges, to quote a Rhode Island declaration, or the first principles of nature, to quote a declaration from Pennsylvania. Thus, to maintain and violate our liberties and to transmit them unimpaired to posterity, as one Maryland declaration put it, separation from Great Britain was the only remaining course. When the Continental Congress convened in spring 1776, the colonists did not need to be reminded of their grievances or the righteousness of their cause. Their declarations made their points clear. Rather, what they sought was leadership from a united Congress. As another Maryland declaration explained, national independence could be achieved only upon a close union and continental confederation. Yet when Thomas Jefferson arrived in Philadelphia on May 14, 1776, he was torn and arguably did not want to be there. The Commonwealth of Virginia was about to debate its constitution and Jefferson had spent weeks preparing a draft for the Commonwealth's consideration. But Jefferson, due to illness, had been the last of the Virginia delegation to arrive in Philadelphia. So he was chosen to stay behind in Philadelphia while the other delegates headed back to Virginia. When fellow delegate George Wythe left for Williamsburg, Jefferson tucked a copy of his draft constitution in White's baggage. Virginia cribbed from Jefferson's proposed preamble, but not much else. In Philadelphia, Congress tasked Jefferson and his committee of five to prepare the first draft of the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson submitted the committee's draft to Congress a little more than two weeks after receiving the assignment. John Adams later recounted that Jefferson had drafted the document in only a couple of days. Jefferson was a busy man in June 19, in 1776. He oversaw multiple committees regarding Canadian affairs, drew up the rules and regulations for congressional debates, and participated in other matters. Moreover, Virginia was operating with a skeleton delegation, providing little opportunity to spread the work around. Nevertheless, Adam urged Jefferson, as busy as he was, to pen the draft, as it would be better for a more measured Southern gentleman rather than a divisive, independent-minded New Englander to take the lead in drafting and promoting the Declaration. As time was of the essence, Jefferson drew heavily from two sources. The preamble of his draft of the Virginia Constitution and the recently enacted Virginia Declaration of Rights. Jefferson's preamble included many of the grievances against King George that, up at, that ultimately appeared in the Declaration. Likewise, the Virginia De Declaration of Rights already had declared men equally free and independent and endowed with the inherent rights, including the right to pursue obtain, and obtain happiness and safety. So ultimately, Jefferson did not propound a new political theory. Often the, he wasn't even introducing new language. Rather, he reiterated what his fellow countrymen already believed and what they had already repeatedly set out in their own declarations. There was no time or appetite for a new theory of American independence. 
Even the words in the Virginia document were not original. The American founding drew upon centuries of British history, most notably the British Declaration of Rights of 1689. That declaration, like the British declarations of the centuries prior, had three basic parts. One, to raise grievances against the king, another to declare the rights of Englishmen, and the third to fashion a government to protect those rights. The American Declaration of Independence adopted the very same structure. In so doing, the Declaration made clear that like much like the English Declaration of Rights, it was a constitutional document that set out a foundation for government. It was a clarion call to the new Americans, you are men of innate and civic equality who are now duty bound to defend your new country. Indeed, once published, the declaration was distributed not only among the colonies, but also to each commander of the Continental Army. What followed was a revolution and the founding of a nation. The later adoption of our Constitution did not consign the Declaration of Independence to a prefatory status. To the contrary, the Declaration remained central to and often preeminent in the American project. As Frederick Douglass later put it, the Declaration of Independence was a ring bolt to the chain of our nation's destiny. America's fight against the most glaring contradiction, the peculiar institution of slavery, immediately put the ring bolt to its greatest test. From the beginning, the founders understood that slavery violated the national call to equality. James Madison wrote in his notes during the Constitutional Convention, where slavery exists, the Republican theory becomes still more fallacious. Governor Morris likewise condemned the nefarious institution as the curse of heaven on the states where it prevailed. In fact, because many of the founding fathers were so deeply ashamed of slavery, they refused to include the word slave in the original Constitution. Slavery now appears only once in the 13th Amendment that abolished it. Nevertheless, slavery persisted for eight decades after the ratification of the Constitution. It was the rot at the core of our country's foundation. To some, that made America irredeemable. William Lloyd Garrison, the fiery abolitionist, called the Constitution covenant with death and an agreement with hell. He refused to vote and called for the dissolution of the Union. He would even burn copies of the Constitution during his speeches. In his view, America was a slave-holding nation and there could be no compromise with the evil of slavery. Others of the era, however, were unwilling to give up on the American project. Equal citizenship was a black man's birthright, and to give up on America was to concede that America's blacks never were equal citizens, as the Declaration of Independence had promised them. To demoralize freedmen and slaves in that way, as Frederick Douglass argued, served only to increase the hopelessness of their bondage. The real goal, Douglas repeatedly made clear, was to convince Americans that the country was unmoored but not lost. But many Americans, even those who did not live in the South or themselves owned slaves, undermined Douglas's message. Take, for instance, another Douglas of, the, of that era, Stephen A. Douglas. The Illinois senator touted an odd brand of popular sovereignty. 
In his view, each territory had the right to determine whether to permit slavery within its border. When confronted with the simple, clear, and direct language of the Declaration declaring that all men were created equal, Douglas responded in 1857 by arguing that the text did not mean what it said. To him, the Declaration's famous opening meant only that, quote, British subjects on the continent were equal to British subjects born and residing in Great Britain. Thus, he reduced a universal truth to a narrow national one. A large group of Illinois citizens were dismayed by Douglas's attack on the Declaration of Independence, so they invited a young lawyer to respond to Douglas in Springfield, Illinois. That man, of course, was Abraham Lincoln, who, be who became perhaps the Declaration's greatest proponent and advocate. Lincoln conceded that the Declaration did not assert the obvious untruth that all were then actually enjoying equality, nor yet that they were about to confer it immediately upon them. But man's unequal station meant only that the dream was deferred, it remained to be attained. As Lincoln explained, the Declaration proposed a standard maxim of equality for free society, which should be familiar to all and revered by all, constantly looked to, constantly labored for, and even though never perfectly attained, constantly approximated, and thereby constantly spreading and deepening in its influence and augmenting the happiness and value of life to all people of all colors everywhere. To Lincoln, this promise of equality was not merely important to the nation. It was foundational. There was no American nation without the Declaration of Independence. A year after his debates in Springfield, Lincoln made this strikingly clear. He, uh, he declared, think nothing of me, take no thought for the political fate of any man, whomsoever, but come back to the truths that are in the Declaration of Independence. You may do anything with me you choose, if you will, but heed these sacred principles. You may, not, you may not only defeat me for the Senate, but you may take me and put me to death. Unfortunately, President Lincoln would later pay that ultimate price. So too would almost 700,000 Americans. Decades of racial strife followed, but time and again, the Declaration of Independence remained our national North Star, or as Pauline Mayer describes it, our American scripture. We did not surrender our inheritance as equal men endowed by our creator with inalienable rights. Neither slavery nor Jim Crow defeated us. We recognize that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. declared decades ago that the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. The history of our nation is our shared struggle to live up to that promise. It is a slow, arduous battle, but we have yet to fail. Today, there is a notable pessimism about the state of our country and cynicism about our founding. There are some who would even cancel our founders. We are all aware of those who assert, much like Garrison, that America is a racist and irredeemable nation. But there are many more of us, I think, who feel that America is not so broken as it is adrift at sea. Some of you come from my generation. You remember reciting 
accepting the Pledge of Allegiance, the Fourth of July celebrations, and the shared belief that our nation was destined for greatness. Others of you are younger. You lived in the twilight of that life or feel nostalgia for a world that you missed or you don't remember it at all. In all cases, we sense among us an American spirit we cannot quite capture. We sense amidst the noise and din telling us that truth does not exist, that there is something true, something transcendent, something solid, something that pulls us together rather than divides us. As I said, my wife and I this summer were inspired when we saw in the RV parks the people who still hold these values and who still believe as they flew proudly so many flags in the RV parks. I lay no claim to the answer or to the gospel, but this I do know, for whatever it is worth, the Declaration of Independence has weathered every storm for 245 years. It birthed the great nation. It abolished the sin of slavery, and it endeavored to address its effects. While we have failed the Declaration time and again, and the ideals of the Declaration time and again, I know of no time when the ideals have failed us. Ultimately, the Declaration endures because it articulates truth. It was not a grand philosophy contrived by clever academics. It came from antecedent shared values, unlike so many of the theories of more recent vintage. As Lincoln taught us, the Declaration reflects the noble understanding of the justice of the Creator to His creatures and the enlightened belief that nothing stamped with the divine image and likeness was sent into the world to be trodden on and degraded and embruted by its fellows. The Declaration simply recounts what the Church has taught for millennia and what we once universally accepted as a given. All men are created and all men are created equal. No force on earth can take away what God has given us. Thus, I leave you with this thought. The Declaration of Independence may or may not be the American scripture, as Pauline Mayer's book is entitled, but it establishes a moral ideal that we as citizens are duty-bound to uphold and sustain. We may fall short, but our imperfection does not relieve us of our obligation. My nuns and my grandparents lived out their sacred vocation in a time of stark racial animus and did so with pride, with dignity, and with honor. May we find it within ourselves to emulate them. Lincoln put it best as in his Gettysburg Address. It is rather for us to be the here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we find increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead will not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. May we as a people and a nation endure and prosper. May God bless you, may and may God bless and preserve our great country. Thank you, and go Irish.